Shall we start? All right, can you hear me? Okay, everyone. We can hear you. Great. <laughs> okay, well, well, we're waiting for uh, Dr. Humanowitz to, to uh, log on with all of this. I'll just let you know that we see you all and welcome to Lunch with Docs. My name's Judy Talley. I've been with PMD Alliance since we started and occasionally come in and uh, host these events. And Amy is with us as well. She is the person who makes sure all of our um, technical and electronic things are working correctly. So we're going to start. <clears throat> Excuse me, we'll start as just as soon as Dr. Uh, we see him come on. But meanwhile, I know today's topic should be of interest to a lot of us because it's all those little things and those odd symptoms which you don't hear about very often at, um, you know, uh, doctors' talks when they're talking about the major symptoms of PD and, um, you know, going through the kind of general information that most people want. Because today, Dr. Humanowitz is going to um, take time to talk with us about things that often don't get covered, like shortness of breath, fatigue, any questions you have about um, something that's happening with you or your loved one where you say, gosh, I wonder, is it because I'm getting older? Or is it because I have another condition or is it the Parkinson's? So this is your chance to ask those kinds of questions. And um, if you've been with us before, you know that down at the bottom of your screen, there's a band and on that black band is a, a little icon for chat. And so during the presentation, if you want to type in a question, um, then we'll see it while Dr. Hermanowitz is talking, but it won't disrupt his, his conversation with us. Um, and then later he will either an directly answer that question or he may answer it in the course of what he's talking to us about. Mm -hmm. At the end of Dr. Hermanowitz's talk, we'll, we're going to mute you when he begins to speak so that um, if you've got a barking dog in the background or want to get up and say something to someone, your mic will be muted. After he's talked, we'll turn on the mics so that those of you who simply want to ask a question right online using the audio, all you have to do is just speak and um, we'll hear your question. You won't have to type it in. So, and then one thing, and I'll remind you again uh, towards the end of uh, when Dr. Hermanis is done speaking, is please consider your questions in terms of what all of us would be interested in. Sometimes there are very personal situations um, that, you know, you want to, want to talk to a doctor about, but because this is a public forum, it would be a good idea to ask your physician. Ask your physician. Uh, you know, personally and privately in, in one of the appointments about something that is very specific to your situation. So if you can kind of keep your, any questions you have, keep in mind that we all want to have um, information that we can go away with, that would be very much appreciated. And then the only other thing is at the end, Amy's going to come on and uh, tell us a little bit about the new PMD Alliance program called Inspire Me. So I see Dr. Hermanowitz, did I see you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, well I just introduced you. Thanks so much for coming, I'm Judy Talley. We've done, I think we did a lunch with docs a, a while back, but I'm so happy to see you again. And I'm just gonna turn it over to you. I've told the folks we're gonna talk about all those symptoms and fatigue and, and uh, shortness of breath and those things that usually don't get covered when we talk uh, and physicians talk right. to us about PD in general. So you're on. Okay. Okay. Nice to talk with everybody. I'm Neil Hermanowitz. I'm in Irvine, California, and I thought we could talk about some of the so-called non-motor manifestations of Parkinson's disease. Now, Parkinson's is still, the diagnosis is established by the main motor findings, which include things like tremor and slowness and rigidity or stiffness and change of walking or balance also. So the diagnosis remains a motor diagnosis, but we've known for a long time that, at least for some people, 
non-motor symptoms may be the initial manifestations of Parkinson's, including things like sleep disturbances, mood changes, cognitive changes, uh, bowel changes. You know, it could conceivably precede the onset of the motor manifestations by a decade or more. Uh, and these symptoms can occur in, in some people at, at, at any time during the course of their experience with Parkinson's disease. Now, I, I just just a, a dis disclaimer at the beginning, uh, you know, there's something called the medical student's disease where you hear about things and you think, oh my gosh, I've got that. Uh, when, when, when you go to med medical school and residency, you, you learn about all these things that can go awry with the human body. And just because I'm mentioning these things doesn't mean that you will ever have any of these things. But I think it's you know, not a bad idea to be educated to hear about things that could possibly occur. So if they come up and you experience them, then, then you can discuss them with your, with your uh, physician or your treating uh, provider. So one of the things I wanted to mention at the, at the outset, which um, I, I just didn't want to neglect, was the impact of Parkinson's disease potentially on skin, uh, certainly a non-motor manifestation. And we know that people with Parkinson's disease not uncommonly have sort of a ruddy, sometimes scaly rash on their scalp or on their face, or including on other uh, parts of the body. And that dermatologists know that typically that that can be associated with Parkinson's disease. Often it's uh, fairly easily treatable by using a steroid cream, which you can buy over the counter, but it does warrant a visit to the dermatologist. The other thing about skin that I mentioned, and I've taken up the habit of mentioning routinely with my patients, which I didn't used to do, but it came to my attention not too long ago by one of my patients, and she had, she had uh, been diagnosed with a skin cancer called melanoma, which is not a kind of skin cancer that you want to have. Well, you, want to, you don't want to have any kind of skin cancer, but this one can sometimes be uh, troubling and nasty. And in reality, people with Parkinson's disease do, for some reason that we don't understand, have a slightly higher risk of having a skin cancer called melanoma. And for that reason, it does warrant a visit to a dermatologist at least once a year to be checked out, uh, have, have them look at your, your skin and make sure that there's nothing that they're concerned about. Uh, my patients sometimes ask me to look at their skin. I tell them I'm, uh, you know, I'm uh, I may be okay in, in my specialty, but I'm a bad dermatologist. So it really does require either a confident primary care physician uh, or a dermatologist to take a careful look at people's skin. Now there's a, a long list of, of so-called non-motor symptoms that can occur in people with Parkinson's disease. Some of them are more common than others, disturbances of bladder function or bowel function are pretty common. As I mentioned at the outset, bowel problems can be an early indicator. I mean, just because you have constipation or bloating doesn't mean that later in life one is going to get Parkinson's disease. But there have been studies going back uh, to the 90s uh, uh, describing people with infrequent bowel movements in one study from Honolulu, for example who were followed over time, over approximately 24 years. And some of those people who are having infrequent bowel movements uh, have a higher risk of getting later in life Parkinson's disease. But it can occur later, after the diagnosis has been established as well, the uh, problems with constipation. I should mention that these, these non-motor manifestations were recently reviewed by the Movement Disorder Society, of which I'm a member. I actually, they changed their name some years ago to the Parkinson's disease and Movement Disorder Society, which is an international society, which meets once a year. This year it's going to be in southern France. Uh, last year it was in Hong Kong. A year after it's going to be in Philadelphia. And I usually attend those meetings. But they did have a, a review of, of non motor manifestations of Parkinson's disease and potential treatments. So I thought I would touch on, on some of those things today. One of the things that they didn't uh, talk about, which comes up in my practice with some frequency, is shortness of breath. And I thought I would also start you know, early uh, mentioning that because it's often not recognized as a com component possibly of Parkinson's disease. Now, many things can cause shortness of breath and it's really important that your primary care doctor or a cardiologist or a pulmonologist make sure that there aren't other common, more common things that could be contributing to shortness of breath, emphysema, something called a pulmonary embolism, which, which some of my patients in the past have had. Uh, people who are not moving as much as they used to may pull uh, blood into the veins in their legs and form a clot, which can break off 
and go through the heart out into the lungs. And that is, in fact, a, a potentially life-threatening situation and can cause an acute uh, uh, symptom of, of shortness of breath. And, of course, other things, uh, asthma, as I mentioned, emphysema, pneumonia, uh, all these things can cause shortness of breath. But if after a careful uh, assessment by primary care physician, pulmonologist, or cardiologist, there's no other underlying cause identified, then the, then the idea does come up, could this be associated with Parkinson's itself? And in fact, it can be. It's been described actually for a number of years uh, in medical literature about people with Parkinson's having shortness of breath. And, and actually, every part of the breathing system could be uh, a component of this. And earlier uh, publications suggest that there could, in some people, be some obstruction in the upper airway, uh, difficulty also with chest expansion. There have been correlations to the, the duration of benefit of medication. For example, levodopa, which many, most people with Parkinson's will take, after some time can tend to wear off. And as, the, you know, meaning it, it doesn't last for four hours or six hours, it lasts for three hours instead of five hours as it did in the past. And as the, as the benefit of the medication is wearing down, sometimes people develop a sense of shortness of breath. Now that's one thing, but that's not all uh, the reasons why people with Parkinson's may have shortness of breath. Uh, there are people who are not having these fluctuations with levodopa who still experience the shortness of breath. In fact, in one study done, I think it was in Europe, uh, about 50% of the people who were experiencing shortness of breath were not correlating it to the timing of their medication. So it did not seem to be a medication fluctuation associated symptom. There, there are some publications that suggest that, that part of the problem, at least for some people with Parkinson's and shortness of breath, could be in the detection system in our bodies. We have sensors in our brain and elsewhere in our carotid arteries in our neck, uh, detecting how much oxygen and carbon dioxide we have in our blood. And in some people, when we measure their levels of oxygen, for example, which we can do fairly simply, it's completely normal. And yet they still feel the sense of shortness of breath, which has suggested that there may be a problem in that detection system. That there, the body is saying, oh, you're not getting enough oxygen, or you have too much carbon, carbon dioxide, and that sends signals to the brain that you're, you need to breathe faster and harder. So there could be something awry, not going right with the detection system. That's, at this point, speculation. It hasn't been confirmed by careful study, but there is supportive evidence that that could be occurring. Now, when I explain this to my patients who are having shortness of breath, they go, okay, that's all good and fine, but what do we do about that? And at this point, the answer is, I just don't know. Uh, I think we need to learn more about it, for one thing, and to try to figure out first, are there other things causing the shortness of breath? Is it due to some other issue? But if those things are ruled out, if there isn't uh, that present, other things present, then we're sort of stuck with maybe this is a problem with the detection system or the brain's response to faulty signals about the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sorry to say, I don't know how to fix that yet, but I have told my patients I'm working on it, I'm trying to think more about it, read more about it, and I haven't come across the answers yet in my reading of the medical literature, but uh, looking at it. So just worth keeping in mind that, that could be from Parkinson's itself. Now, there are a no number of other so-called non-motor things. I hear them every day. I heard just a little while ago from one of my patients and her husband, actually. It's a wife who's my patient. Her husband comes along, and, and she has this problem of fatigue, another very common complaint. In people with Parkinson's, they just have it. They're not sleepy. They're not depressed. They just have a sense of lack of energy, uh, which is pervasive often uh, throughout the day and occurs every day. And I have to say that it's not unique to Parkinson's disease. There are people who have multiple sclerosis who have fatigue, people with Alzheimer's disease, people with stroke, and sometimes have this complaint of fatigue. So it's suspicious to be originating someplace in the brain, but we don't really know where in the brain this may be coming from. Um, mentioning it alone is, is something that you know, is, improves our understanding of what may be going on in Parkinson's disease. But the question, of course, arises, what do we do about fatigue? This was commented on by that review uh, by the Movement Disorder Society 
And they looked at various things, including uh, Ritalin, methylphenidate, which is an energizing, alerting medication. And they didn't find that to be, the evidence was insufficient to say that, yes, this does work. Uh, and the same was held for a medication called uh, Provigil or Modafinil, which is another alerting medication. They thought it was uh, the evidence supporting its, it, its efficacy, how well it works, was insufficient. They did think, the movement disorders group that, that looked at this, did think that resagiline, also known as Asilec, which is approved and has been on the market for Parkinson's use for some years now, may be helpful in treating fatigue. So that's something that at least you could discuss with your physician. Uh, resagiline or Asilec is a once-a-day medication, fairly uh, benign in terms of its potential side effects. Um, uh, it is generic now, but nonetheless, it's uh, unfortunately still uh, expensive in many cases, depending on your insurance. That's the only thing I could come up with from their review that suggests that it may be beneficial for that very frequent and troubling symptom of fatigue. Another problem I heard just a moment ago is insomnia, difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep. And this really troubles a lot of my patients. Uh, most often they fall asleep okay, but then they have difficulty maintaining sleep. They wake up at 11 p.m. or 2 a.m. and then have difficulty returning to sleep. And what to do about that? And I have to say, I've tried all the usual remedies for, uh, for sleep, and none of them are surefire successes. In the, in the review article, uh, the authors did find that a medication for Parkinson's called rotigotine, which you may have heard of as the new pro patch, uh, was likely, they described it as likely efficacious and possibly useful. Uh, they did look at some other things like uh, the medication, a sleeping pill called Lunesta, which they thought had insufficient evidence but was possibly uh, uh, useful. They also looked at melatonin at the usual dose of three to five milligrams, and they said that there was insufficient evidence to support it, but they, that they said it was also possibly useful. I've used other medications in my practice. Trazodone is widely used for, for sleep. Uh, another uh, uh, antidepressant medication called mirtazapine has been widely used uh, for sleep. But these things didn't really have enough information in publication in people with Parkinson's disease to be reviewed uh, by this committee. Another complaint I hear is apathy. And it's often the spouse, more often the wife, uh, saying, well, he just doesn't seem so interested in things. The grandchildren come over and he's not really uh, taking an interest in their activities or doesn't seem to want to socialize. And it's not depression. <clears throat> Excuse me, there's no sense of sadness. People, when you ask them, are you sad? They go, no. And if you say, what well, the other things during your day that you take enjoyment from? Go, yeah, yes, I do. And if I do a, a depression uh, rating scale with them. I, I use in my practice the Beck depression inventory on occasion. And they don't really answer questions suggesting that they're having depression. They're just uh, it's a diminished uh, interest in activities. And again, a very you know, it, it is not likely to respond to antidepressant medication in, in, in the case where people don't have a mood disorder. The the committee that did this review found that ribostigmine, also known as Exelon, may be helpful. Uh, for that. In fact, they, they described it as efficacious, meaning that there was data supporting that it does work. And they did describe it in, in clinical practice as being possibly useful. That's about as strong uh, a wording as they give uh, in this uh, article. Uh, or I would say it's the second strong as they give. Uh, similar, but not identical to apathy, would be depression, which unfortunately does come up, sometimes very early in the course of Parkinson's disease, and, and sometimes even preceding the appearance of the motor symptoms. And, and there are a number of antidepressants that are available uh, now, and, and this seems to be a new one every six or 12 months or so. Uh, they, the, the committee from the Movement Disorder Society did review the available literature uh, on antidepressants in Parkinson's disease, and this was also reviewed by the Parkinson's study group some time ago. And what the recent review, published earlier this year by the Movement Disorder Society, indicated was that, interestingly, uh, primapexol, also known as Mirapax, a Parkinson's medication, uh, can be beneficial uh, for depression in people with Parkinson's disease. 
And in fact, that's been known for a very long time. I remember seeing, when I was at a meeting in, in Europe years ago for the Movement Disorder Society, that came up, and I think, at least in the past, that Primapexol was, that was marketed in Europe for its antidepressant qualities. They don't do that in the United States. It's not been FDA approved for depression. But I have to say that I have noticed in my practice that it has been beneficial. Uh, for depression, some people with Parkinson's who are having depression. Now, one has to be careful with all these medications, but particularly dopamine agonists, of which Premapexol is one, and Nurofex, Nupro, the patch, another. Uh, they, have, they seem to have a, a particular ability, uh, more so than other medications, to bring out sometimes uh, unwanted behaviors that can be troubling. Uh, they're collectively called impulse control disorder. This is compulsive gambling or shopping or spending. And I do query my patients, all my patients who are taking any dopamine enhancing medications, whether they may be having these kinds of symptoms. An antidepressant that emerged also as efficacious and clinically useful is Effexor, also known as venlafaxine. Now, I'm not saying that things like Zoloft or uh, Celexa or Lexapro are not helpful. It's just that the authors reviewed what was available in people with Parkinson's disease, reviewed uh, publications on these topics in Parkinson's disease, and that's what they turned up as being efficacious and clinically useful, the effects are, and Mirapex. Uh, another problem that people talk about pretty commonly is excessive daytime sleepiness. I've, uh, this can really be a problem. People will be on occasion falling asleep in conversation. I've had people, believe it or not, fall asleep in my exam rooms. Uh, not that I, you know, I, I didn't take it personally. I hope that wasn't meant <laughs> personally. But people sometimes have excessive drowsiness. And there are a couple of things to keep in mind. One is that there may be other nighttime issues uh, that could be contributing to daytime drowsiness, like sleep apnea. And that really is detectable only by doing a formal sleep study. But clues are, you know, if the spouse or the bed partner says, boy, they snore like that, like you would not believe. Uh, or if somebody is struggling for their breath during the night and being awakened by gasping, that does raise a serious concern about uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And it is, can be confirmed fairly easily by doing a formal sleep study, either in sleep lab or they sometimes do home sleep studies these days as well. Also, that can be treated. Uh, a family member of mine has obstructive sleep apnea, and it changed their life once it was treated by using a device fitting over the nose to sort of force air into the upper airway to keep it open so that obstruction is alleviated. But if that is not, if not the case, then how do we deal with uh, excessive daytime sleepiness? There really aren't any surefire methods that have been proven to be effective for that. Uh, they mentioned, you know, the things that, that they mentioned in the review, among others, were, again, modafinil, which is pro-vigil, this alerting medication. But they said the evidence was really insufficient to prove that it is, in fact, efficacious, but they labeled this as being possibly useful. They also commented on caffeine, which is, frankly, my choice for my patients, my first choice, if they're having daytime somnolence. It's such a simple thing to do would be to have some caffeine in the morning generally not afternoon, because it can have an impact on, on falling asleep at night. And caffeine is not a short-acting substance. Uh, so I have them take, have a cup of coffee, or if they prefer tea, or whatever their caffeine source, in the uh, morning hours. And that sometimes can be helpful, although in this review they said it was, uh, the evidence was insufficient at this time, and they labeled it as investigational. Another symptom that was addressed that I hear about every day in my practice is excessive saliva or drooling. Sometimes just at night, a woman yesterday told me that she was, uh, you know, waking up at night or in the morning and she would, her, her nightgown would be wet with saliva from her drooling. But other patients have it, uh, mine have it during the day, to the, sometimes to the point that they actually have like a napkin uh, pinned to their blouse or their shirt to collect the saliva as it's falling out of the mouth. Adjusting their Parkinson's medications, I don't think that's likely to be helpful. There are some things that I've tried, uh, sometimes uh, just uh, using some, some eye drops under the tongue. The pharmacists sometimes get excited about this. 
but using some atropine eye drops, but, but writing on the prescription, don't put it in your eyes, put a few drops on a Q-tip and then swabbing it underneath the tongue. That's a trick that many of us employ in our practice, people in movement, working in movement disorders, although that was not reviewed by this committee. But that's an easy first thing to do. You have to be careful that you don't squirt it in your mouth and swallow a whole bunch because if it gets into the brain, it can actually cause confusion at higher doses. Uh, there's a medication called glycopyrrolate, which has been around forever, uh, which has, was found in, in this uh, committee's review to be uh, probably efficacious and, and clinically useful. Uh, sometimes I found that people find that it, it, it turns the saliva from a thin saliva to a more thicker uh, saliva, which they don't like. It, it does not get into the brain, which is a good thing for that type of medication. But that, that could be helpful. Another thing, when it's really troubling, and these other methods have not been successful, is that I will inject botulinum toxin. There are two types. There's Botox, which everybody's heard of, and there's another one called Myoblock, which is somewhat different. But both of these have been found to be beneficial in terms of trying to reduce some of the saliva. Usually, I just injected a couple of points into the parotid gland. It's pretty simple to do. Uh, if you know what you're doing. It's you know, behind, just behind the jawbone and then just a little bit in front of the jaw here. Uh, two injections on each side of either Botox or Myoblock. And that can have an effect of reducing saliva. About 50% of the saliva in the mouth is made by these parotid glands. So even if you shut them off completely, which we don't do with Botox, uh, you would still have other salivary glands underneath here, which would still be not producing saliva, but that can be helpful. And I have patients who come in about every three months, which is about how long it usually lasts, for their Botox or Myoblock injections into the salivary glands. Another uh, non-motor uh, symptom that was addressed by this committee was uh, so-called psychosis of Parkinson's disease. And this would include things like Oh, I think there are people in the house that uh, there are children on the sofa or there's a stranger in the bathroom or my mother's in bed with me, which I heard once. My deceased mother was in bed, in bed with me or there are cats in the trees outside. All sorts of one of my patients not long ago told me that he uh, saw an elephant in his house. And his wife said, well, the house is not big enough for an elephant. And he said it was a baby elephant. Um, that's the only time I've heard an elephant. Uh, but people do sometimes see things, and the hallucinations are, can be auditory, hearing things, uh, conversations, or music playing. Uh, I've heard several patients tell me that they've heard music, on the choir music, opera music, um, just radio playing, or conversations going on someplace. And, and somebody earlier today, uh, his wife has Parkinson's disease, and he said that she had a, a couple of occurrences where uh, she thought he, her husband, was her father. Uh, she had a, a what's called a delusional misidentification, mistaking one person for another. And sometimes people have delusions that uh, there are things going on that should not be happening. Somebody's trying to get into my finances. I had a patient years ago who said that his neighbor was stealing his tools from his garage. That was not the case. Sometimes people say, well, my wife is having an affair with a 90-year-old neighbor. Probably not true. Uh, these things can be very upsetting and uh, disturbing, not just just to the patient, but to the, the caregiver, care partner, uh, spouse as well. And the, the, the Committee for the Movement Disorder Society reviewed treatments uh, for psychosis symptoms, and they found a couple of medications to be uh, efficacious. One is clozapine, which has been around for a long time. It's, it, it was the first what's called atypical antipsychotic medication, so it's, <clears throat> it's been around longer than I've been a neurologist. Uh, and it does work. I've had the experience with it over the years that it works, and it works pretty quickly within days. People can often have a reduction of these symptoms, but it's a nuisance uh, to use. It requires a weekly blood test once a week for six months, and then every two weeks for six months, then once a month forever uh, to check the blood counts because it's got a rare but potentially dangerous side effect of, of reducing the production of white blood cells, which would be not a good thing if that were to occur. So it requires this blood testing. Um, another, uh, so the committee did find that clozapine is efficacious and clinically useful. It just requires careful monitoring. 
Another medication that they found efficacious and clinically useful is called Pimavanserin. The trade name for that is uh, Nuplazid. This has been out now for a couple of years and specifically developed for uh, treating psychosis symptoms in people with Parkinson's disease. Um, uh, they also, they talked about a couple other medications. Quetiapine, also known as Seroquel, has been widely used for psychosis symptoms in Parkinson's disease. The Movement Disorder Society found that the evidence was insufficient. They said it was insufficient evidence, but possibly useful. But they didn't find from the clinical trials that exist so far, uh, they were not convinced that the evidence proved uh, that it was efficacious. One more thing I want to touch on, then if we have time, we can ask, uh, answer some questions, um, is, again, I mentioned a couple of times already, is the constipation. Now, uh, when my patients tell me, or their spouses or care partners tell me that everything was going along as usual, and then kind of abruptly things came apart, the symptoms are worse, or the hallucinations have increased, or they're, they're just struggling more with their mobility, you know, that's not the typical behavior of Parkinson's disease, to abruptly change. This is usually something, with rare exception, but usually something that changes very gradually, over, if it's changing at all, over the course of years. And people sometimes can have a stretch of several years where they don't seem to change much at all. So if somebody abruptly turns a bad corner, uh, I'm thinking, well, what, something else is going on, and no something else the things that compromise something else could be a bladder infection. Uh, it could be just about anything. But one of the other common things is uh, constipation. I have taken up the uh, habit now of when this is occurring, when people tell me things are not going well abruptly, I get an x-ray of their abdomen. Because even they say, well, yes, I ask them, when was your last bowel movement? And they will say, well, like yesterday. And sometimes I'll do an x-ray of their abdomen. And they're completely full of stool. Uh, and that has been reported and presented at the meeting I attend as a reason that people, pardon me, it's not a common reason, uh, that people show up in the emergency department being constipated. And that, too, can cause things to turn in a bad direction. And the treatment is not more medication. The treatment is getting that stool to move somehow. And that can be a trick uh, to get that done. Once it's accumulated, things like Miralax or fiber or prunes are unlikely to work. Uh, so once people are completely jammed, that may require, and I can't make recommendations on an individual basis, but in my experience in my practice, you know, that's a time for an enema or something called magnesium citrate, which is a liquid that you drink. And, and, and when you drink it, you don't want to get too far away from the bathroom because it can work almost explosively in some people. But to try to prevent that stool accumulation to deal with the chronic constipation that occurs in Parkinson's disease, the committee did uh, review a few, few things that found them to be uh, helpful. They thought, uh, uh, again, Miralax, also known as polyethylene glycol, sounds like antifreeze for the gut, which is exactly what it is, uh, is likely efficacious. And I tell my patients who are in my practice, I tell you, if they're having frequent issues with constipation, I, I suggest that they start with, with Miralax or polyethylene glycol and just stay on it daily uh, because that problem is not likely to be a transient problem. This is something that's going to be ongoing. Uh, in my practice, uh, if, if Miralax alone is not doing the job, then I say stay on the Miralax and add some milk of magnesium, maybe two tablespoons at that time. And that usually uh, uh, takes care of the problem. The uh, review committee did find the Miralax likely efficacious and possibly useful. They also found, interestingly, uh, probiotics and prebiotic fiber to be efficacious and clinically useful. So that may be another thing to, to keep in mind. That, that really covers the, the non-motor things that I wanted to talk about. Uh, today. Um, if you have questions, as best I can, again, I can't give individual advice, but if you have questions about these things, I'm happy to hear any questions at this time. Hey, Dr. Romanowitz, this wonderful information. I've made a lot of notes. Um, we did have okay. some questions come up on the chat feature here, so I want to make sure we catch those. Um, so a person was asking if you talk a bit about weight loss as a symptom. 
Oh yeah, weight weight loss. Uh, again, many, many things can cause weight loss. Uh, it's it's well known uh, to occur in people with Parkinson's disease who are not trying to lose weight. Uh, one publication that I saw some years ago indicated that about 40% of people with Parkinson's disease lose weight without trying. And exactly why that is, we don't know. There, you know maybe the thermostat is set higher, but people are not necessarily consuming less in the form of calories. They're just dropping pounds. There may be other issues. Maybe calorie consumption is diminished. The sense of smell and taste can be altered in, in people with Parkinson's disease, and that may discourage people from eating as much as they used to. It's harder to get up and get to the kitchen or the refrigerator. So that sort of uh, snacking type of behavior may have diminished. Swallowing can be uh, more of a challenge, so people may be cutting back calories for that reason. Uh, but it does occur. I always tell my patients it, it, it could be due to Parkinson's disease, but I want to make sure their internist isn't suspicious about something else going on besides Parkinson's disease. So I want to get uh, their intern, their primary care physician or care provider also on board. Are there other things that we need to be concerned about? Could be there be a, a thyroid disorder, for example, contributing to weight loss? Okay. Well, um, um, we had another question um, from yep. Jane. Um, Jane, it, it does, uh, I think, is unmuted. So, Jane, if you want, you can just yes. speak your question. <clears throat> Um, yes, my question is regarding uh, bladder issues, and yeah. if this is if a neurogenic bladder is common in Parkinson's. Unfortunately, it is. Uh, and this is another one of the symptoms that just drives my patients and their spouses uh, crazy. Uh, because unfortunately, it's not only during the day; it's often during the night. And people have a sense, I've got to go again. I just went 15 minutes ago, but I have to go again. And so again, getting up out of bed at night can be a big production. It often involves the uh, spouse or care partner. Yes, and there are things that can be done uh, to try to improve them. I'm just looking at my list. Uh, I didn't have it on the, the written list here, but that also was reviewed by this committee. Um, nothing definitive that's, again, the silver bullet for this problem. Uh, I oftentimes will have patients e evaluated by a urologist or if it's a woman by a gynecologist who has an interest in, in bladder problems just to make sure that I'm not missing something. But that part of the nervous system that controls bladder and bowel function can be altered in people with Parkinson's disease and does unfortunately come up. I have tried many medications uh, for that, indicated for overactive bladder. And, and none of them yet are perfect or just uh, eliminate the problem. But improvements can be made. Sometimes people get Botox injections into their bladder to address that. Great. Thank you. Okay. It looks like... On a, on a, I, I was just going to mention on a side note, some of these bladder medications get into the brain. There was just a recent publication about this again, about so-called anticholinergic medications. And that would include things like oxybutynin or ditropan. It also includes diphenhydramine or Benadryl. These are both anticholinergic medications. Oxybutynin is a good bladder medication, but it is not a good brain medication. And I discourage my patients from using oxybutynin or ditropan for their overactive bladder. Thank you. Okay, it looks like Gail has, she's a question. Gail, are you there? I am, thank you. I just had a quick question about <clears throat> seeing if anybody else has. I have a, um, every time I, I shouldn't say every time, but as my medication wears off, I can start to feel it as a pain in the middle of my back or actually underneath one shoulder yeah. bag. It's always in one specific place. It's on the same side as my Parkinson's. Well, I'll, I'll jump in if other people don't. This is not an uncommon experience. Uh, some uh, reports indicate that up to 80% of people with Parkinson's disease have pain associated with it. Uh, it can sometimes be an early uh, symptom, even especially in the shoulder, uh, even before treatment has been initiated. Um, if it's clearly tied to the timing of your medication, then I would be, not for you specifically, but when it comes up in my practice, uh, then I would be trying to think of strategies to try to address that end of dose wearing off to try to minimize the uh, 
appearance of that. My colleagues and I here at UCI were talking about this actually last night after we'd finished our patients, so-called central pain syndrome, central meaning coming from the central nervous system, probably the brain, maybe the spinal cord, uh, which has been reported in people with Parkinson's disease. And in my experience, it's often in the groin area. People have this rather nasty pain that it's not clearly related to the timing of their medication. And, and for that, we try, and not always successfully, using medications that are used for chronic pain syndromes, and that would be gabapentin or pregabalin, also known as Neurontin and Lyrica, similar medications. Thank you. Okay, we had one come in um, asking, how do we know if sim it's symptoms of psychosis, PD-related, versus dementia? Well, uh, PD psychosis is actually different than dementia. So dementia is impairment of cognitive functioning in, in two areas like language and memory to the extent that it interferes with daily functioning. That's the simple def definition of, of dementia. And not all people with psychosis in Parkinson's disease have dementia. Psychosis specifically are the phenomena of hallucinations or illusions and delusional thoughts. So not everybody with Parkinson's psychosis is demented, and not everybody with Parkinson's dementia has psychosis. They're, they're really separate things. They, they tend to go together, but not invariably so. Okay. Well, there's one here that asks about, uh, a person, a caregiver asks about someone who had extreme fatigue after a fall and seemed to be regressing. Any comments on that, fatigue after a fall? Yeah. Yeah, I, in terms of, again, anything that stresses the system can at least temporarily, I think transiently in most cases, bring out symptoms more. Um, one, I would, you know, again, I'm not speaking for that individual, but if somebody came to me in my practice and they were saying they had had a fall and they were, it seemed to be a setback for them, I would likely, one, I want to make sure there aren't other things going on that could be contributing to that sense of fatigue. I remember years ago, a patient was having a lot of fatigue and it turned out that he had congestive heart failure that had not been recognized. So it's always worthwhile thinking, oh, you know, not everything is due to Parkinson's disease. There are other things that come up and one has to keep that as, as best as one can uh, at the, in the front of one's thinking. Um, but if there are no other things, I want to be wondering, well, what caused the fall in the first place? That could be Parkinson's, but was there something that contributed to the fall, I'd be thinking about other things that may be uh, uh, going on. Uh, and if not, if there aren't other uh, identifiable factors in my patients when they've had a setback like that, I just give it some more time to see if things don't eventually get back to where they were. Okay, thank you. Um, and another question, I've heard this from uh, people over the years I've worked with people with PD. Are there any natural forms of dopamine um, that don't have with less side effects than Cinemat causes? Uh, there are natural forms of, of, of levodopa, uh, and I suppose you can get dopamine from some other source as well. You know, if you take dopamine, it doesn't get into the brain, it just makes you nauseated, so you don't want to do that. Uh, there are some forms of levodopa from fava beans, uh, for example, have, have levodopa in them. And so does a plant called mucinopurians. Um, and it's come up over the years, well, should I be getting my levodopa from those sources? And my answer is no. Uh, for one thing, you don't know the dose that you're taking. It's not quantified. So how much levodopa is in mucinopurians? Uh, I don't know. I don't think anybody has really done that analysis, so it has a titrate and there could be variability from one batch to the next. And secondly, it doesn't come with carbidopa. Now, car carbidopa is in that pill, carbidopa levodopa, which combined together is called cinnamon. Carbidopa is there just to try to reduce side effects like nausea associated with levodopa. And you're not going to get that from any kind of bean, like fava bean or mucinopurine source. So yes, there are natural sources, but I think you put yourself into some jeopardy, uh, or not you specifically, but my patients who have asked me in the past, uh, I, I think they put themselves in some jeopardy by relying on that. They don't know how much they're taking. That makes sense, that makes sense. How about 
But this question, um, we had one of our, our uh, listeners say she was told about gastroparesi from, and ask, is it from Parkinson's and has it caused, it's caused small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, gastroparesis, which is a delayed or slow emptying of the stomach, uh, does occur in people with Parkinson's disease. Um, it sometimes is a contributing factor to bloating. I, one of my patients in years ago, you know, I would tap on his abdomen. It was like tapping on a drum. His abdomen would be tight and tense and, and distended. He couldn't fasten his pants because of this bloating that he had, which is really troubling. And I do see that on occasion. It can contribute also to, uh, to nausea when people have gastroparesis. That's, that's unfortunately very difficult to, to treat. The, there's a medication called metoclopramide or Reglan, which is uh, used for gastroparesis, but that medication is a dopamine blocking drug. So you can't take it. It's contraindicated in people with Parkinson's disease. There are other things that are used uh, generally for gastroparesis. The antibiotic erythromycin, uh, interestingly, is a, can have a promotility effects for encouraging things to move through. And I've tried that in some of my patients in the past. There's an electrical device, which I've never, I've never had any experience with, but it, but it can, it's like a deep stomach stimulation instead of deep brain stimulation. It's a stimulating device going to the gut to try to address the gastroparesis. So when I encounter patients with that, one, I want to confirm the diagnosis. So I often send them to a gastroenterologist and work with them in terms of trying to get around this problem. It's a, it's a, it's a big issue because, of course, if things aren't getting out of your stomach, your medications are not getting into your brain. They're getting hung up in your stomach. They get absorbed later outside of the stomach through the intestine, especially levodopa. We know that to be the case. And so that could be hanging things up in terms of medication delivery to the brain. Okay, that's great to know. Um, we've also had a question about lightheadedness not related to low blood pressure. Yeah, what's that from? <laughs> I hear it uh, about dizziness or lightheadedness not related to low blood pressure. So we, we check here in our clinic blood pressure seated and standing along with pulse. Every patient, every visit, because the and the fluctuation, the dropping of blood pressure when people stand up, it's fairly common. When you detect it uh, and it's causing symptoms, then it's treatable with, with uh, volume expansion by increasing fluid intake and sometimes with medication. But those, those people who are feeling, uh, more often than not, they don't call it lightheadedness in my practice. They say they're dizzy. And they're not dizzy because of low blood pressure. And I suspect this is a, a symptom of Parkinson's disease sort of related to the imbalance or postural instability or lack of equilibrium that can occur in people with Parkinson's disease. And I wish I had uh, a better explanation and certainly wish I had a solution for that, but I, unfortunately I don't. Oh, thank you. Um, we just had someone ask if you would repeat and spell the recommended medication for fatigue. Oh, for fatigue, that's, the generic name is resagiline and that's spelled R-A-S-A-G-I-L-I-N-E. And the trade name for that is Azilect, A-Z-I-L-E-C-T. Okay, that's great. It doesn't work in, so that takes, when, when people start that medication, it takes a month or more for really to, to have an effect. So if you take it for two or three days and it doesn't work, then I would not give up on it. I would stay with it longer. We had a couple questions I'll kind of combine. One person was asking about, does PD change, is it change your coming in with Alzheimer's? And also another uh, person who said they were wondering about memory loss. They seem to be experiencing more memory loss. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, we know that people with Parkinson's disease can uh, have cognitive changes. That's Sometimes they're subtle. Uh, there you know, could be just difficult. You know, recall can be delayed. So you know, what's the name of that actor in that movie? You know, oh, it's whoever, uh, Matt Damon. Sort of. um, so it can take longer, but with time and sometimes encouragement, the, the memory comes back. Um, people sometimes with Parkinson's disease do have more 
uh, troubling cognitive impairment that does reach what I would describe as dementia. So there is this entity of Parkinson's disease associated dementia. And I've had some patients over the years uh, when they ultimately passed away, their spouses or family members wanted to know, well, what, what was this? Uh, what happened here? And some of these people have gone on to autopsy to, to look and see. And often what we have found in those just a handful of cases that we've looked at in, in autopsy was that they had Parkinson's changes elsewhere in the brain, in areas of the brain involved with thinking and memory. But oftentimes they had associated with that uh, changes of Alzheimer's disease too. So it was a mixed picture of both Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. This is still a, a, a point of confusion, I think, for all of us who work in this field. Uh, what, what is causing the cognitive change? We also know that there are people who they, they go to an autopsy and they don't have Alzheimer's, they don't have Parkinson's, they don't have Alzheimer's disease. You can find changes of Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease in the brains of people who didn't have either one of those diagnoses. So it's, uh, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Picking that out. Okay, well, thanks. Um, just a couple more uh, commenting about visual disturbances. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Well, again, pretty common that people have complaints about uh, their vision. And you know, one is, you know, they, they, they go to see their eye doctor, their optometrist, ophthalmologist, uh, and they, their lenses are fine. They don't find any problem with their refraction. So then what's, the, what's the, the issue there? Well, there could be a couple of things. One is that people with Parkinson's disease not uncommonly have double vision. The part of the brain that's moving the eyes together can also be affected by Parkinson's disease. So people can have their eyes not quite in sync, and as a consequence, they get two, two images of the same object. And that can be corrected sometimes using prisms that a ophthalmologist or a neuro-ophthalmologist can put into the lenses. We also know that there can be retinal changes in people with Parkinson's disease. We've got an apparatus on the hall here that we plan to use in looking at the retina of people with Parkinson's disease as a, for, for several interests actually, uh, as an investigational technique and also for clinical assessment. So there are some areas within the, in the back of the eye where the light is being detected in the retina that can be altered by Parkinson's disease. And that's Unfortunately, we don't know how to fix at this point. I think I'm saying that too often. We don't know how to fix that problem. Uh, so there's a lot of work still to be uh, done, understanding some of these things and how to come up with a solution. Great. Okay, well, our last two questions are medications related. The first one is how much does certain foods create problems for the absorption of medication? Yeah. Well, they all do. <laughs> So if you, have, if you have food in your stomach, it delays the absorption of your medication. There's a lot of discussion about protein, especially with levodopa. Um, but it's not just protein, it's all foods can delay or reduce the absorption of these medications. Uh, protein comes up because levodopa is basically an amino acid. And proteins are made out of amino acids. So when you have a, a, lot, a big protein load, a hamburger, for example, uh, that, that protein gets broken down to an amino acids, and there are receptors in your guts and also in the brain that are there waiting to grab onto amino acids. And if you fill those receptors with hamburger, the levodopa won't, won't be able to get in and stick and be drawn into the circulation and ultimately drawn into the brain. Now, I have to say, I think that protein discussion is probably overly stated, and it makes people crazy. Oh, I just had my breakfast, now I can't take my pill, or I took my pill, I can't have my breakfast. And, and quite frankly, I, at least in my experience, other people may have a different opinion, that, that protein discussion that is usually not transforming. It doesn't make a big difference to people. I did have a patient years ago who for breakfast would have a beef burrito, and then he told me that his levodopa wouldn't work. Well, he's taking the, a big bomb of the levodopa antidote and then he's taking his medication. So I said, well, have oatmeal instead of your cheese and beef uh, burrito. And that did seem to work better for him. But that's the exception uh, more than common. Okay, that's good to know because there is such an emphasis on separating protein and uh, carbidopa, levodopa. There's another question here. Um, 
let's see, is Cinemet cumulative? If I skip a dose because I don't need to be particularly coordinated during that time, is there a cumulative lessening of effectiveness on symptoms? No, not necessarily. There are some people who are kind of, like, and we call them with diabetes, they're brittle diabetics. Yeah, they have that very tight control of their blood sugar. But they're, you know, for many people with Parkinson's, if they skip a dose, they don't really miss it. Uh, some of my patients do. Uh, there are even people who, who stop taking medication for a day or two, and they feel great. Uh, but then it usually catches up with them. So I, you know, I, I do like people to uh, not miss their doses. Everybody does miss a dose. In my, maybe it's me, or maybe it's Southern California. I don't know. But everybody, I mean, I can't, if I had to take a pill three, four, six times a day, I think I'd miss some doses too. Um, <laughs> So I, uh, it's hard on people, and so everybody does uh, miss a dose or two or now and then. And it, for most people, it does not have any dire consequences. Oh, that's good to know. Now, one last one. Jane raised her hand again, yes. and she wants to ask you what will be our last questions for you. Thank you. Yeah, okay. uh, we have been told, my husband has Parkinson's, we have been told for many years that essential tremor is completely separate from Parkinson's disease. But yeah. to me, I'm a physical therapist, there, is, there must be some kind of connection. What is your opinion? Um, there are certainly people I have in my practice who, when I, they come to see me for the first time and they've got a tremor, and they look like they've got Parkinson's, I'll say, and they're, they're 68 years old. And, and I'll say, when did that tremor start? And they go, well, when I was in my 30s. That's not Parkinson's disease. They probably had essential tremor first for years, and sometimes they, you know, half the time essential tremor runs in families. Approximately half is a family history, so they sometimes go hand in hand. Essential, essential tremor is pretty common. It's about six times more common than Parkinson's disease. So it's not unthinkable that somebody could have both. Now there, are, there, are, there have been some studies linking them. There have been some families. I remember a study from Spain where a high percentage of people with Parkinson's later, uh, uh, high percentage of people with essential tremor later develop Parkinson's disease. And that's, that has been a discussion. Is it a, one of, one of my colleagues in Texas calls it a form thrust or an initial indicator of something happening that ultimately shows itself to be, or can transform into Parkinson's disease. I don't think that idea has gelled with all of us yet, but there are certainly people who have both. We refer to it as sometimes PDET or ETPD, essential tremor Parkinson's disease. And again, that's, and even some of my patients who look to me, they just have what appears to be classic essential tremor, but when I examine them, they're kind of low on their finger tapping. Uh, they sometimes have a little bit of rest tremor. It's not all with, with posture or with action. So there is some clinical overlap, and that can be puzzling to people. You know, say I've been doing, I got white hair. I've been doing this for a long time, and it's still, as a clinician who does it a lot and has for a long time, that's puzzling to me. So what is the overlap? I don't think, at least in most people, uh, which we think have essential tremor, it doesn't. I don't think there's a dopamine deficiency in the brain that's been identified. And and just as a as a last comment. The tremor that is clearly Parkinson's disease does not reliably respond to medication. So uh, even, you know, medication for Parkinson's is most beneficial for stiffness and slowness. There are some people who are fortunate their tremor just gets so much better with levodopa or with other dopaminergic medications, but there are many who don't. And that's, that can be so frustrating. Mm -hmm. So the tremor of Parkinson's is not clearly to a great extent connected to the dopamine deficiency state. There's some evidence that it could be connected to serotonin, the different brain chemical in the brain. Wow. That is, that is really new information. Thank you for telling us that. Um, it looks like uh, we've kind of gone to the end of our questions here. So I want to thank you, Dr. Hermanowitz. As always, you just are so informative and so easy to understand the information that you provide for us. So thank you. And then for everyone, we...
recorded this talk that Dr. Was just in, gave in a few days. It will be on our YouTube channel, so you can use it. To, you um, share it with family or friends, or go back and review the information. It will all be there to you. Just be patient for a few days until we get it up and check with us. And then the last thing is Rebecca wants to take a few minutes to tell you about a 